When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Skims or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout all birds uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash income. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes in detail. Hey friends, I'm Rachel Grohl and I'm your host for the Hearing Jesus podcast, where I help you to know God and to make him known. Friends, it's Missions Week. I'm so excited about this week. Each day we're going to be talking about a different country around the world and we're just showcasing God's heart for the nations. Two of the episodes are going to be about my experiences and what God has just been recently showing me. And then three of the episodes are about friends of mine that live in different parts of the world or have come from different parts of the world and what God has been doing in their hearts, in their minds, in their nations with the advancement of the gospel. I'm so excited about this week. And as we lean into what God might have for us this week, I would like you to prayerfully consider what he's calling you to. There's going to be lots of opportunities presented for you, but I want you to realize that God is calling you to something. The call of every Christian is to know him and to make him known. God's heart for the nations is evident and clear. And that's one of the things that I think I've really been praying about. Over the last couple of years, I've really spent a lot of time helping you to know him. But now I think it's time for us to have opportunities to make him known. This week is the beginning of the next trajectory of the Hearing Jesus podcast and She Hears Ministry. I have so many exciting things coming up that I can't wait to share with you about. But first, we're going to spend some time learning about different parts of the world and how we can get involved. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. And today is a special recap episode where I decided to give a recap of my recent trip to El Salvador. And so for those of you that don't know, I recently went to El Salvador with Compassion International and it was a phenomenal trip. It was my first trip to El Salvador. It was also my first trip with Compassion. So I've been an advocate of Compassion. If you listen to the show, you know they're one of the sponsors of the show. The tithe of the show actually goes to Compassion to help support children and some of the different programs and things that we've been doing there. And so this was an opportunity for me to go and actually see in action what Compassion is doing. And You know, there was a lot of takeaways from this trip, but I wanted to kind of share some behind the scenes information because to be perfectly honest, I was really surprised, pleasantly surprised and blown away. And, you know, I was team compassion before we left, but now I am even more confident in the work that compassion is doing. If you don't know, one of the hallmarks of my ministry has been global orphan care. And so I've worked in a variety of capacities. At one point, I was a children and outreach pastor at a local church. And one of the responsibilities and one of the things that we did within that church was mission trips. And so most of my experience was in the area of Kenya. But after that, I transitioned to another small global orphan care organization where I was the director of spiritual care, and I worked with teams in five countries, both in Africa and the Caribbean. And so I'm no stranger to poverty. I'm no stranger to missions and God's heart for the nations. But when the podcast got big, 
about last November or so, I knew that it was time for me to step down from that full-time job. I had just gotten a offer for multiple books and um, that first book in that series is due in about three weeks. So pray for me there if you're listening to this uh, mid-August or late August. But between writing the books and two podcasts and the speaking events and all of those things, it just became very clear that the Lord was calling me to step down. And I will say, and I was going to wait to share this till next month, but I'm I'm sure and I'm confident that God's going to give me even more to speak about then. But one of the things that was really hard for me with that season was stepping down in regards to the in-country relationships that I had had. And by in-country, what I mean is Yes, I worked remotely and most of my work was at a computer and writing curriculum and all of those kinds of things, overseeing things. But I had spent a lot of time in the Dominican Republic training and working with the team. And the leader of that team started, I think, about six months after I did. And so for about five years, I really worked closely, specifically with that team doing training and visiting and mission trips and all those kinds of things. And so when I knew the Lord was calling me out of that and to step into she hears and the hearing Jesus realm of things full time. I really grieved that it was a season in my life that I really grieved. And it was hard for me to understand what that would look like because missions and God's heart for the nations is so embedded in my calling and what God has called me to do. And and I evangelism, discipleship, all those things. And what did that look like when it was within the realm of podcasting? And so I started to sense this transition for quite a while, actually, and I was ignoring it, ignoring it, ignoring it. And I don't know if you've ever gone through a season of life like that, but this was what I could only describe as holy discontent. And that's not my phrase. I've heard that used by other people before, but it was holy discontent in the sense of I was no longer content with the things that I was doing that had previously been a calling, very clearly a calling, because God was starting to transition me to something else. And you know, the persistent experience of God in my life is that he has asked for obedience before he has shown me the plan. That is very nerve wracking, especially for my husband. And if you are like me, a planner, and you kind of want to know what your five year, 10 year, 20 year plan is, when God disrupts things like that, it can be very, very difficult. And so for me, what I've seen over and over again, you know, every couple of years or so, it will resurface where God expects radical obedience for me before he shows me the plan. And so when this was happening, I knew that God was calling me to step out. And it was to the point where I was going to be in disobedience if I continue to ignore God. And that might sound weird, thinking of stepping down from an international missions role as disobedience, because we think, okay, it's ministry. But in my case, it was. And so what was really interesting is the way that God worked it out. When I stepped down from that role, what I also stepped into was this partnership with Compassion International, where they became not just a partner with the show, but it became this opportunity to live out missionally the things that were embedded in my heart that I could not separate from in a really practical, seamless way using the podcast. And so I'm so thankful for even the onset of the relationship with Compassion and how God did that. And of course, one of the things that happened, I say, of course, because it's very surprising, but yet I love the way that God works. One of the things that's coming down the pike next month is I'm going to be able to travel with a group to go back to the Dominican Republic and to do some work with the DR campus of Compassion. And it's been just this beautiful healing picture where the Lord's been like, okay, here, here you go, kid. I'm going to give you back the thing that you grieved. And of course, I didn't know that at the time. That came later, a couple months later. And it's been just a beautiful picture of how the Lord has seen me. I've felt really, really seen by compassion and by the Lord because of the way that he's worked this all out. And so long story short, that will come next month. We have some great things coming down the pike for you to hear about what God is doing in the DR. But this month I was able to travel. My husband and I went, were able to travel to El Salvador. And so for the first time ever, we were able to join Compassion on a trip and just see, come and see and enjoy all of the amazing things that God is doing through the people in El Salvador. And, you know, I, I hesitated on 
I guess maybe hesitate isn't the right word. I debated, I think, in my mind about how to best communicate what God did this week. And I think I'm still unpacking some of that. So you will, I'm sure, hear that as we continue with the podcast. But I want to back up to even before the trip happened. If you don't know, uh, you can go back and you can listen to some previous episodes that talk about this. But one of the things that my husband and I have been called to during our marriage was an international adoption. And so... Years ago, when I was working in Kenya, there was this miraculous story of this adoption that God called us to. And it's actually going to be shared in one of the chapters in my upcoming book. And so I'm not going to share all of the details. But that has been something that has been like an undercurrent in my life for a very long time. And so the process of, of that adoption took about five years. And that's actually a failed adoption. It, it didn't, we do not have that little boy in our home. And so then there's been about five years of grief and sorrow through that whole process. And so before I was getting ready to leave, I'm, of course, working on this next book. It's about the female prophets in scripture. And I was organizing everything out because my process for writing is a little bit different probably than everybody else's process. I just start writing and then I go back and I organize everything. And so as I was organizing everything, I'm doing part Bible study, part teaching, and part personal testimony. I realized that I had personal testimonies in all the other chapters except for the Deborah chapter. And the minute I realized that, the Holy Spirit said, write about Gideon, which was our, our little guy that that we lost. And I just was really confused in that moment because I was like, Lord, write about Gideon. And he said, write about Gideon. And I said, but Deborah is the victory chapter. And in my life, Gideon's story does not feel like a victory. In fact, it feels like sorrow. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to write about Gideon in the victory chapter. And so I sat with that for a couple of days I cried over it. I reached out to a couple of close friends and just asked for a prayer. And people that know me know that story in my life and knew how overwhelming that felt. Because at this point in my life, it's one of those things, I don't know if maybe you're like this, but it's one of those things where I have just kept buried. And yes, I grieved that whole situation over a, a long time period, but I keep it buried because I don't want to think about it. If you don't know, and just a brief recap, there was some miraculous things that happened where God called us very clearly to adopt a little boy. And at the very tail end of that process, he was trafficked to Germany. And he, along with lots of other kids, were trafficked through a trafficking ring that pretty much made it impossible to get him back. And we know where he is. He's safe. We worked with the government to help bring back kids that were not safe through that whole channel of things. And that whole process took about a year or two. And there was a decision made. There was a lot of those kids that were taken for domestic servitude. There was kids that were taken as an option that was easier than a traditional adoption and less expensive. And there was kids that were taking for the reasons that you probably are imagining. And so the government, the embassy went in and tried to determine where, if they could find the kids, where they were at and what was going on and what they were there for. And our little guy, Gideon, was one of many children that were in quote unquote adopted homes. And so the embassy at that point made the decision that any of the children that had been adopted and that were in safe environments after the period of two years, it would have been more traumatic to pull them out of those environments than to just leave them there with supervision. And so Gideon was one of the children that was left behind in in the country. And so for us, we continued to help and we worked with the country and we funded some projects. We brought back a lot of kids. There were some kids that were just not even orphans. They were just taken right off the street. And we were able to get them reunited with their families. Some of them, we had to get some medical care for them because as you can imagine, in those kinds of scenarios, there was some damage done to their bodies. There was trauma care involved and just safety plans that were involved. And so this was a big, huge thing in our life. And I still don't have 100% grip on the theology of all of it. But what I do know is that the government at that point had said that we had stopped because of the tenacity of a mother's heart fighting to find her kid. We had stopped so many of these trafficking cases from going forward because we were able to shut down this trafficking ring. And actually, as part of that 
they called it the Gideon Project. They, as part of that, they changed the way that they do international adoption, and they now have a like a chip that follows them from birth to death, and all sorts of things because they were like falsifying death records. That's how they're getting kids out of the country. And so for me, that is the background that all of this is happening the week before the El Salvador trip, that when God says to me, I want you to write out Gideon's story, that's the heaviness of what's going on. And it's something that I don't often think about. And I keep it buried because there's still a lot of pain there. And so when the Holy Spirit said, I want you to write this, um, I was obedient. And it was two days before we left for El Salvador that I wrote out Gideon's story. And through tears and weeping and prayer, I wrote it out. And you can read the whole story in in the victory chapter of Deborah. And God really cleared some headspace and some heart space out for me when that all happened. And so this is where I'm at when I'm approaching this trip to El Salvador. And I realized as we're on the plane, on the flight there, I, you know, got the Wi-Fi and I opened up my Facebook app and I realized, you know, how Facebook will show the memories. It was the anniversary of the very first time I flew over to meet Gideon. 11 years to the day. And here I am on a plane on the way to El Salvador. And I just thought, man, like, what are the odds of the timing of that being the exact same. And then I realized that it was the first trip that Tim and I had taken together, first mission trip, you know, in-country missions-themed trip that Tim and I had taken together since the last time we had left Kenya. Tim had not been on a in-country trip since. We've gone places, like we've gone to Italy, we've gone on vacations, but we had not gone on any kind of missions-themed trip since the, the day that we left Kenya. Again, what are the odds of all of that happening, all of that happening at the same time? And it just showed me that God is in the details. And so that is the approach that we have as we're headed into El Salvador. Heart still a little bit tender, a little bit raw, healing. I, don't, I guess I don't want to say healed, but healing. You know, God had already begun this work in me. And so that's the filter that we enter into this trip. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. In today's episode, I mention a really painful part of my story, which was our failed adoption. And there are many aspects of healing that the Lord did in my life, but one of those aspects, the emotional health, was done through the help of a good therapist. One of the things that I think that can be so hard within the church is the stigma that sometimes can be around getting help from a therapist. However, I believe that we have a God who wants us healed and whole, and sometimes that means getting some extra help. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's online, it's designed to be convenient and flexible around your schedule. There's a brief questionnaire to fill out and then you get matched with a licensed therapist. And sometimes I've had therapists that just weren't a good match and I had to switch. If that happens, it's okay. You can switch therapists at any time with no additional charge. Start down your path to healing today with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com forward slash hearing Jesus to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com forward slash hearing Jesus. Hey friends, one of the things that I hate is having stinky laundry when I come back home from a trip. And so this past month when I went to Texas, I actually took some Earth Breeze laundry sheets with me. I've been trying them out and so far I absolutely love them. You know, doing laundry while traveling can sometimes be a hassle, but that's why I love using these things. They make tackling laundry even on the go super easy and convenient. With Earth Breeze, you can simply grab a sheet and toss it in your laundry. It's that simple. Plus, they're lightweight, they're compact, there's no liquid, so you can easily pack them in your carry-on without worrying about anything. Here's the best part. Earth Breeze comes in eco-friendly, plastic-free packaging, so you can actually feel good about your choices even when you're traveling. If you want a laundry solution that's simple and effective for your next trip, give Earth Breeze a try. Right now, you can get 40% off your subscription at earthbreeze.com forward slash hearing Jesus. It's the perfect way to keep your clothes clean without the hassle, wherever your adventures may take you. Hey there, friends. With holiday season just around the corner, we're all looking for ways to save time and stress less. That's where HelloFresh comes in. They deliver fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes straight to your doorstep. 
Seriously, it's a game changer for home cooking. Whether you're craving comforting foods or trying to please picky eaters, HelloFresh has you covered with rotating menus of 50 recipes to choose from each week. No more recipe ruts. You can whip up fun, flavorful meals without hunting down specialty ingredients. And their pre-portioned ingredients means less food waste. It's perfect for teaching teens how to cook. I can't tell you how much time HelloFresh has saved me in the kitchen. I love how easy it is to customize recipes so that every meal is just how I like it. Plus, there's always something new to try. Some of my favorites, their delicious tacos and the creamy garlic pasta, always a hit at my dinner table. And guess what? You can check out HelloFresh Market for over 100 add-on items like desserts and quick breakfast. This month, they even have Thanksgiving items to help wow your crowd with pretty minimal effort. Now for the best part, get 10 free meals at hellofresh.com forward slash free hearing Jesus. This offer applies across seven boxes for new subscribers only and varies by plan. That's right. 10 free HelloFresh meals. Just go to hellofresh.com forward slash free hearing Jesus. Remember, it's America's number one meal kit and you don't want to miss out on this delicious offer. Let me just say that we felt very cared for from the very first moment that we walked off of our plane in El Salvador between the air-conditioned bus and water prepared for us and gifts that were given as they as we enter and there's some you know coffee and some candy for our our ride and just very very cared for the staff did introductions they were very very friendly I mean from the moment we stepped onto the soil in El Salvador we felt really cared for by Compassion as an organization and there was a lot of things that happened on this trip I think one of the things that were significant to me that I wanted to mention was something that caught me off guard because like I said, I have worked in this space for a long time. And one of the first things that they said to us in El Salvador is it's really important that you tell the children that you love them. And for me, my like American child protection red flags are going up because that isn't necessarily something that you would do in the States. You know, when we have volunteers that work with kids in kids ministry here in the States, we wouldn't, we don't do that because there's like a boundary issue there. And so I went to the staff and I just said, you know, can you explain this a little bit to me? And of course they said, well, children need to know that they are loved. And I said, well, from the American perspective, that's kind of difficult to understand. And they said, well, if you were to say te amo, then yes, it would feel inappropriate. That's not the right word. He said, you need to say te quiero because the difference is te quiero is I want to be around you. I have friendly affection for you. I like you. You're valuable. And if you speak Spanish and I'm getting any of this wrong, you know, please feel free to, to, use your own filter for that. But the explanation of how there's two different words for love and the way that the love of God is communicated when you speak that over a child, it made so much sense to me. And so I appreciated even the nuance of that where we are not even on the footsteps of the center yet. And we're learning about not just the emotional needs, but the spiritual needs of the kids and how we can step into that role during the week that we're there. And so I love that aspect of that. I, I want to just kind of recognize that even though I've been around the block, so to speak, when it comes to the missions world, I think that the way that compassion approaches thing, things is very different. And I will be honest, when I set out, I was like, you know what, this is an influencer trip, we're going to go and we're going to tour, and we're going to see all these things. I think I'm going to say to them at the end of the trip, I want to go on a real trip. And my husband said, what do you mean a real trip? And I said, well, you know, when we do missions or when we've done missions in the past, we're like building buildings and we're pouring cement floors and we're, you know, out doing evangelism or we're doing medical care or all these different things. That's the kind of trip I want to do. And I very quickly realized how wrong I was in that philosophy. And I don't want to discredit any of the work that that I've done in the past, that God has done with our teams in the past, because we've done some really great, amazing things. But what I realized very quickly is that compassion's philosophy is different. Compassion works within the context of three C's, where compassion is actually not the center of the story. They are Christ-centered, meaning everything that they do is Christ-centered and it's based in the hope of the gospel. They are church-driven 
and they are child-centered. So what that means is compassion is the funding mechanism that allows the church to function the way it's supposed to. And so when you go in country, they don't call them mission trips. They call them vision trips because they want you to come and see what God is doing through the organization, through the local church, through the people. And you know, one of the things that was really significant to me is that you see zero branding. Now, if you were following me on social media, you might've seen the day that we went to the compassion office. When we went to the compassion field office, yes, we saw, okay, there's a sign there. It says compassion. But when you are out in the communities, when you are going to the centers where the children are, you don't see any compassion branding. It all is run through the the local church. So the heroes in the story, of course, Jesus is the hero in the story, but the heroes in that story really are the local staff, the local church staff, the local pastors that are making it happen. It's a phenomenal approach that kind of caught me off guard. But then if we think about this whole idea of helping without hurting, which I've talked about in the past. How do we serve the poor without dishonoring the poor? How do we get involved in what God is already doing around the world? This was not a scenario where we were going to come in with this American savior complex where we're going to show them how to do things or we're going to be the heroes of the story. No, we're going to watch and see what God is doing and how compassion is working in these countries in a way that empowers the local church. I love that model. I love it, love it, love it. And as somebody that's been around the block in a variety of different contexts, it was so refreshing to see the church operating the way it was supposed to operate. And I will say, there was a lot of things that happened throughout the week, but the thing that I took away the most is this is how the body of Christ should be operating. We should be empowering local people that are called to do the work of the ministry because what is our role as leaders? You know, if I think about this in terms of pastoral leadership, one of my roles as a pastor is to equip the saints to do the work, not for me to do all the work. I preach that, I teach that, but yet for some reason it was not translating into missions. And so as we're going throughout the week, we're starting to see and hear how God is operating. And, you know, on day two, and this is really interesting, on day two, of course, I checked I wasn't really on social media that much, but I was trying to show pictures and videos of what we were doing. So I checked Facebook again, and of course, a memory pops up, and I realized that day two was the last day that we ever saw Gideon. It was the anniversary of that. And in person, I mean, with the last day we ever saw him in person. And I thought, man, that is interesting that this is where we're at at this time and space. And that was also the day that we met our sponsored child in El Salvador. And as we're sitting there at lunch and as we're like talking to this little guy's mom, I realized for the first time that our little sponsored guy in El Salvador had the same birthday as Gideon. We did not choose him for that reason. And I'm not kidding you when I say that we did not know that. I did not know that before we went that they had the same birthday. And so in that moment, like I felt that pain of tears singing my eyes and the Holy Spirit says, I see you. I see you. And let me just say, like, while there has been healing in the last couple of years in this area, one of the things I said at the end of this trip was if my healing had maybe been 10% complete, I feel like 80% of it happened on this trip. Because not only did that happen, but when we walked into the church and we saw what was at the front, we see this phrase that says, make him know. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll know that one of the things I say all the time is the goal of the podcast is to know Jesus for you to know him and then also to learn how to make him known, to know him and how to make him known. It's woven all throughout my book, the book that I'm getting ready to turn in. It's something I say all the time on the podcast. It's say something I say all the time in person to know him and to make him known. That is the call of every believer. And so to walk into this church and see this phrase, to make him known, the Holy Spirit says, I see you. And so we're going throughout this whole week and we're learning about how everything is done. We're seeing just the fruit of the labor. Very, I don't want to say very, many of the staff 
that work there were compassion students themselves. Not only are they proof of concept, meaning they have grown up through the program and now they are implementing the program, they themselves are now sponsoring children in other parts of the world. And it was so amazing to see what God has done through the alumni that have grown up from the program just in El Salvador. And and think this is happening globally. This is happening over 2 million kids worldwide are experiencing this program. We're just seeing a small snapshot of it. And so I was really, really thankful to be able to just see up close how God is doing this. And we went to a center where the pastor and his wife have been working, I think it was like over 20 years. And one of the things that we got to see at that center that day was the files of the kids. And as we're looking through, you literally could point to any, I think there's like five, 400 and some kids at that center. You could point to any single one of those kids and they could pull out a file. And these files were thick. Again, it's on my social media if you want to look what they look like. But every penny is accounted for. Every letter that was written to sponsors, every medical checkup, the curriculum that they use for the level that they're at, both spiritual care curriculum, education curriculum, parent education curriculum, the mentorship that they have with these families, all of it from start to finish, from the day that child enters the program all the way through current, there is a documented record of every single thing. That from a insider perspective is unheard of. And it is so refreshing to see how dedicated they are. And there's over 2.2 million of those files on all of those kids. Every single kid has that. So if you are a sponsor of a child, technically you could or a team, you know, you could go to that country and you could pinpoint their exact file. I've seen them. They're literally there. And so I appreciate that from just like my nerded out brain, you know, behind the scenes kind of concept. But it showed me that not only are these kids being well taken care of, they're known. They are known to the point where they know what their spiritual needs are, their missional needs, their emotional needs, their physical needs. They are known. And isn't just that the heart of the gospel, a picture of the gospel? And to be perfectly honest, that's what I was experiencing as I was there. You know, Tim and I didn't really say too much to anybody. Nobody even really knows. I think I might have said one thing to maybe my compassion relationship holder. But other than that, like, and that was kind of like brief and on the bus. Nobody really knows what we've been through. And yet we see the Holy Spirit orchestrating these moments to remind us, hey, I see you. It was such a powerful trip for us because it was a reminder that I'm known, even in my pain, even in my things that I keep buried and hidden and I don't say out loud to other people normally, God sees that and I'm known. And not just I'm known, all of those kids are known. And for us this week, we saw such a great example of how compassion does that in El Salvador. I'm getting ready to go, like I said, to the DR, so I'm sure we'll see that there. But I just want to say that if you have been on the fence about sponsoring a child from compassion, send me a message and I will answer any questions that you have because I will say I am even more confident now that this is where the tithe of the show needs to be going. When we see the work that God is doing around the world, I am confident that not only is this a good investment now, it's a good investment on the future. You know, if you didn't listen to the interview I did for this past month, the gentleman, uh, Richmond, that I interviewed, I would just really encourage you to go back and listen to it. But his story, he was a sponsored child with compassion. He's now leading the Pastor Discipleship Network in Africa that is responsible for training all of these pastors in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the impact and the investment of that minuscule, comparatively, investment of you know, the monthly fee that it costs to sponsor a child, the return on that investment from a kingdom perspective, there's no better way to spend a single dollar. I mean, it really is evidence of when these alumni are serving God and they're serving kingdom and they're making a kingdom impact. It is a small price to pay to see what God is doing with with those funds and those people. And let me just say, one of the things that I thought was really striking, well, I guess two things. We had the opportunity to have dinner with some of the alumni. And not only are we hearing their stories and their testimony and all those kinds of things, but 
during dinner, when it was time to pray, one of the alumni, she volunteered to, to pray. And of course it's translated, but as she's praying, it was such a stark reminder for me because as she's praying for a blessing over that meal, she also prayed for those that are wondering what they will eat or where their next meal will come from. And I think that perspective really struck a chord with me because she was on staff now, of course she's alumni, but she serves in a way from understanding truly what poverty looks like. Now I grew up poor by American standards. I grew up poor. We were rich compared to what the people around the world have that are living in poverty every day. But, and I have a heart to serve, but the way that she serves is different than the way you or I would serve because she was one of those kids that wondered where her next meal was coming from and only was able to eat because of the way that compassion provided for her. You know, the centers become this place where she had said she only went home to sleep. The centers become this place where they are engaged. They hang out there all day. They have workshops that teach them how to do hair and to start a business and all of these amazing things. They, they learn through Bible study. They learn through play. They get their education. It's all done through the local church. And it's all done in a way that changes lives for kids. And I really credit that to the leaders within these centers, these church leaders that have been doing it for years and years. One example, real quickly, because I know we're probably about out of time, but there was one center that we were at and we were serving lunch to the Mothers of the Survival Program. And I think it was back in May for our Mother's Day episode where I explained what the survival program was. So if you want to hear more about that, you can go back to and listen to that episode. But the survival program is for mothers and babies. And you know, with my background in anti-trafficking and being in some of the prisons that held babies or some of the, you know, terrible things that happen to moms that are living in poverty, the survival program is a prevention program that keeps some of those things from happening. And it's survival, not just for the babies, but for the moms. One of the things I thought was super interesting and very, very sad was that it wasn't necessarily that the babies had a high mortality rate. It was the moms that were having a high mortality rate. And so the survival program steps in to help combat that. And so we got to spend the day with the the survival program moms. And as we're serving them lunch, there was a mom that had her baby with her, but she also had like a young preschooler with her. And so she had taken her lunch and she gave it to the preschooler. And so I went to the center director, you know, this church staff, and I said, hey, is there any way that there is any extra lunches or can I give my lunch because this mama went is going to go without lunch because she gave it to her preschooler. And so right away we went and we got another lunch for her and we went and found her and gave her this lunch. That happened a couple of times. And so each time I went to the center director and immediately she responded. That day when it was time to leave, we were saying our goodbyes and she came and she found me and she gave me a hug and she gave me a kiss and she said, thank you for seeing them. And I just was so struck by how compassionate she was, how she saw me watching out for them. She recognized that and I felt seen again. I felt seen. I felt known. I felt seen. And That is the same feeling that many of these kids experience that otherwise will not experience it. You know, the the issue in El Salvador specifically was so much gang violence that was happening there where the government in the last couple of years has gone through and really cleaned up a lot of that gang violence and put a lot of the gang members in jail. But the problem with that is they put way more people than just the gang members in jail. There was a lot of people that just look like they're gang members because they're poor or they live in a similar area that were innocently taken to jail. So what that's done is it's left a lot of kids without proper supervision, without parents in the home, or maybe it's just one parent that's gone. But even in that capacity, if you take the dad out of the home, then their opportunity for funding is gone. Their opportunity for for survival is gone. And so a lot of these kids are at the center because it's the only choice they have and it's the only place that they can get hope and yet the center becomes this beacon for hope in their lives you know there were so many kids that we talked to that literally only ate when they were at the center they they did not get meals outside of the center that's the difference that sponsorship makes and when we were able to kind of see how the letter writing process, it gets translated and how that all works. One of the questions that was asked was, 
what's the best thing about compassion and what's the worst thing about compassion? And of course, the best thing was things like we get to eat meals and we have hope and we learn about Jesus and we get an education. You know what the worst thing was? When our sponsors don't write letters back. And I thought, man, we think so little about just a couple words r- written on a letter and it takes us a couple minutes. If you do it in the app, I literally did it on the plane. If you do it in the app, it takes a couple minutes. But for them, these kids carry these letters around with them. And if you've seen any of the videos of the alumni interviews I've done over the last couple months, some of them will pull out their letters and show me on camera, these are the letters my sponsor wrote. There was an alumni dinner and one of the alumni had like a PowerPoint presentation and she starts pulling up pictures of her sponsor and she pulls, she pulled out all these one-liners of things that gave her hope throughout the years that her sponsor wrote to her. And I'm not talking a long letter. I'm talking like four or five sentences, but it was things like, we're so proud of you. We believe in you. We pray that God keeps you healthy and safe. It was all these one-liners that she pulled out and they were words that clung, she clung to for hope. And One of the alumni shared that her dad was involved in gang violence and he actually passed away and she was just heartbroken, of course. But the same week, she got a letter from her sponsored family where the dad in that family had written just a couple of lines to her about how proud he was of her and he was praying for her. And she said it was things like that that got her through some of the darkest moments of her lives. And so I think we don't even realize, yes, that money is necessary. Like we live in a world where money is necessary. You have to buy food, especially in inflation. You know, America is not the only place that inflation has hit. Inflation and cost of groceries and all those kinds of things. We need money to make the world go round. But that's not what they talked about. They talked about the letters. They talked about relationship. They talked about being known. That is what sponsorship does. It creates a relationship with a child on the other side of the world that they would not have otherwise. I've, I've said this multiple times, and if you've been listening to the episodes where I interview alumni, maybe you've picked up on this, but many of the alumni have said to me, you know, the first time I ever heard the words, I love you, it was from a sponsor. I saw that firsthand where these kids are are understanding what love is because of their sponsor, because it's somebody that's consistently speaking words of affirmation over their lives, saying things like, I'm praying for you. It's not just about the money. It's about the relationship. It was just such a great, great trip for me to see the whole philosophy, the whole dynamic, the whole way that compassion operates. And I'm sure I'm going to continue to unpack that over the next couple months. But one of the things I want to leave you with is something that I think really spoke to me. I have, um, of course, had the opportunity to work up close within this realm of poverty and missions for a long time. And the question that I think that I think I will forever ask whenever I go in country is what is the opposite of poverty? I worked in Brooklyn for a long time. I still have a heart for this ministry that we work with in Brooklyn. And if you ask a kid in Brooklyn, what is the opposite of poverty? They will say wealth. If you ask a kid in Kenya, what is the opposite of poverty? They will say justice. And we've seen that in our own lives. When I asked people in El Salvador, what is the opposite of poverty? They said opportunity. It's not wealth for them. It's not justice for them. It's opportunity. Compassion provides opportunity. Compassion speaks to poverty in a way that not just deals with the symptoms, but it eliminates poverty. Alumni are now, not only are they not living in poverty, they are sponsoring kids on their own. They are doctors and they are psychologists and they are teachers and they are the people that are changing things for future generations. It is such an amazing proof of concept that I will be forever sold. You are not going to hear me shut up about this. And so, you know, if you don't like hearing about compassion, then perhaps this is not the podcast for you. Because I think as a Bible study podcast, where we are striving to know him, and to make him known, this is God's heart. Multiple times, when we would interact with kids, the Holy Spirit would whisper whisper to me, this is my heart. 
This is my heart. And that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a heart for you or your kids. But when you are faced up front with poverty, kids that are living in poverty, but they have so much joy and they have hope because of the gospel, that's God's heart. So it's to know him and to make him known. But what I walked away with in this whole week was that not just it's not just about making him known it's about realizing that because of him we are known i'm asking if you would join me join the hearing jesus podcast join me and my family in sponsoring a child through compassion international if you want to hear more or if you would like to sponsor one of the kids that we met in el salvador you can go to compassion.com forward slash hearing jesus or you can text the words hearing jesus to 83393 you can go and you can pick out a child based off of a specific birth date or the same age as your child or a specific gender and hey maybe el salvador isn't the place for you maybe you do want to pick a kid from Um, you know, Europe or Asia or Africa, you can do that as well. But my challenge to you would be to recognize that that is the call of every believer to know him and to make him known. So I think the thing that I would leave you with is this question of how are you making him known? You know, it's not practical for me to go and live on the mission field, but I can support those that are living missionally through compassion. So again, you can head to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to learn more. If you have questions, you can reach out to me. You can either hit the link in the show notes or you can uh, email Rachel at shehears.org and that comes directly to me and I can answer any questions you have. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the God that sees us. You are the God that sees us even in our pain. You see the things that we keep hidden. You are seeing the things that we hide from the rest of the world. You see us. God, I thank you that you not only see us, but that you desire to work in and through us. Lord, I pray for my friends that might have been even on the fence uh, about giving towards compassion. Lord, I pray that my words would be a testimony to how you are working around the world. Lord, I thank you for Compassion International and the way that they continue to serve you. Over 72 years, they continue to serve you in a way that declares that you are God and that it is through you and by you and of you that the church is empowered to do what the church was called to do. God, I thank you for the leaders of compassion. I pray a hedge of protection around them. I pray for my new friends in El Salvador that are leading the pastors and the alumni and the teams that are running this organization there. God, I pray for a hedge of protection around them. I pray for blessing over them and their families. Lord, I pray for endurance to run this race. I pray for their hearts to be protected that can sometimes be torn apart by the issues that come along with poverty. Lord, I just lift them up to you. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to have a voice into this. And I just pray that you would move upon hearts today. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Again, you can head to compassion.com forward slash hearing Jesus to learn more. I hope you're enjoying Missions Week. I wanted to let you know that next week, we're starting a brand new series on the book of Proverbs. We're going to have a workbook available for you to either purchase or download if you're part of our Patreon family. And it's going to be a great way to finish out the year with wisdom. I hope you join us. Proud member of Converge Podcasts. Greetings and God bless. This is Tyler Burns. And this is Dr. Jamar Tisby. And we want to invite you to check out our podcast, Pass the Mic. Dynamic Voices for a Diverse Church. Pass the Mic has been speaking directly to the core concerns of Black Christians for over a decade. On our show, we've got interviews from theologians, historians, actors, activists, and so much more. Not to mention heartfelt, open dialogue on some of the heaviest issues facing the church in the United States. Be sure to subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you there on the next Pass the mic. the mic. Hey, so I'm launching a new season on the podcast, The Doctor and the Nurse. World-renowned brain coach Dr. Daniel Amen joins me as a co-host as we dive deep into the mind and the brain of everything high performance. I've been fascinated for years as I've worked with top athletes, high-powered CEOs, Hollywood actors, and all high performers in, in all types of different fields of how they break through pressure, ignite drive, how they overcome 
distractions, how they put fear on the bench, how they tap into flow state and just dominate all these different areas of high performance. So on this season, my good friend, Dr. Daniel Lehman will break down what is actually going on in the brain in these different areas. And I will give actionable tools to be able to use and apply in your life. So buckle up the doctor and the nurse on the David Nurse Show coming at you.